Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Robert J. Davis, PhD, is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on Boundless Body Radio on episode 179, entitled Supersized Lies. Dr. Davis, also known as the Healthy Skeptic, is an award-winning health journalist. His work has appeared on CNN, PBS, WebMD, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. He is the author of a new book, Supersized Lies, How Myths About Weight Loss Are Keeping Us Fat, and The Truth About What Really Works, which was released in 2021. He has also written three previous books on health, including The Healthy Skeptic and Fitter Faster, The Smart Way to Get in Shape in Just Minutes a Day, which we will be discussing today. He hosts the Healthy Skeptic video series, which dissects the science between popular health claims. Dr. Davis holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in public health from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, and a PhD in health policy from Brandeis University, where he was a Pew Foundation Fellow. Dr. Davis, what an honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. It's great to be with you again, Casey. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, we were talking a little bit offline, and it sounds really warm and sunny where you are in Southern California, and it is not that way here in the outskirts of Salt Lake. So I really hope you're enjoying the warm and beautiful weather. <laughs> Well, there's hope for us all. We just have to maybe wait a few more weeks and it'll be warm everywhere. Yeah, that's right. Um, we talked last time and you said you really take advantage of the outdoors where you are. Are you still hiking quite a bit? I do. I hike. I try to get outside and do something every day, some kind of activity. So that's part of the uh, fun of living in this part of the country. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. We mentioned in the introduction that you wrote a book called Fitter Faster, The Smart Way to Get in Shape in Just Minutes a Day, which you actually decided to re-release. And I wanted to make that the topic of our conversation today. And I wanted to ask you right off the bat, like what made you decide that you wanted to rewrite that book that you, know, that you had previously written? And why did you decide that now was the time to be able to do that? Well, for, first of all, there's been some uh, new information with regard to the science. So I just wanted to update that in the book. But also more importantly, perhaps, I know that you know so many of us have been stuck inside and sort of limited in our activities, gyms closed and all the rest during the pandemic. And I, as people are emerging from this and thinking about how to get in better shape and how to be more healthy after the two years we've all been through, I thought it was a good time to give people some guidance through this book. That's great. Well, I do want to deep dive into the content because I think it's fascinating. But just for the listener, if they didn't catch the first episode that we did with you, can you give us um, a little bit of your background and your story and how you got interested in health and fitness? Sure. I have, um, I'm a health journalist. I've been a health journalist many years um, and also have a personal passion um, for health when it comes to nutrition and also fitness. And my interest in nutrition started in college. Um, my interest in fitness a little bit later. And, and I also have a background in uh, public health and epidemiology. So what I've tried to do is to use that background to actually look at the science, because as we know, there's so many claims around health and fitness and nutrition to actually look at the science, break it down, help people understand, okay, what's true and what's sort of true and what's not true so they can make better decisions for themselves. That's fantastic. I mean, that's why we love your content so much. You know, I, even just this morning, I was talking to a newer client that I just picked up a few weeks ago and she described, you know, getting online and looking up like what exercises to do, what workout programs to do, which way she should be eating. And before long, she's just completely, utterly confused because there is so many conflicting messages out there. You do such a great right. job of really cutting to the chase and getting rid of all the myths and bullshit and getting to the actual kind of facts and science and what is true and what may be less true. Right. Well, thank you for saying that. And I also, my, my goal here is not to tell people what to do, because I think everybody has to make a decision for himself or herself what's best. There's no one set path for everybody. Uh, so it's not to say you should do X or Y, but it's at least to lay out information in a way that people can apply in a way that's going to work for them. Yeah, I love that. It gives people the option to see what works in their lives and see what doesn't work and to be willing to be right about certain things and be wrong about certain things, I think is really, really important and really critical and gives people that that freedom. Um, you know, before we talk about your book, let's let's talk since fitness is in the title, just out of curiosity, in your opinion, how would you define fitness? What does that mean to you? What it means to me is to be able to live your life in a way that you can enjoy it. So if that means that you want to be able to play tennis, or you want to be able to hike or play with your grandkids, whatever it means is to live a full life and not be limited um, because, of, uh, you, uh, because of physical limitation. Now, obviously, we all have conditions that may limit us, whether it's arthritis or other kinds of medical conditions, but to the extent that just simply being uh, sort of out of shape or unable to do things that you want limits you, I think fitness is about 
living your living your best life. That's great. I I think so many people think of fitness and they think of the latest like influencer on Instagram and fitness is that one thing. It's looking a certain way. It's maybe, you know, prepping for a contest or something like that where most people, if you really get down to what they truly want, it might just be playing with their grandkids or like you said, sitting down and sitting, you know, standing back up again without pain. Why do you think it's so important for people to really consider what is fitness to them and what things are important to them? No, I think that's that's absolutely right because I think in the end this is all about you know sometimes we get we get caught up in sort of these other kinds of considerations uh, as you say how you're going to look how you're going to compete whether you're going to reach some goal and I think that's fine if that motivates people that's fine I'm not necessarily criticizing it but I think in the end we perhaps lose sight of this is just all about how we live our lives and it's about how to improve our lives and to make our lives better and so whether we're talking about fitness or nutrition or anything else around wellness that's how I look at it that it's important to be able to think about doing these things so that we can live better lives. And with regard to fitness, it is so important. I see this particularly as people get older, people that I know are getting older. Um, the difference that I see in those who are able to move their bodies regularly, how they're able to do so much more, to be able to go out and walk, to be able to, uh, to enjoy vacations, to be able to do so much more. As you say, simple things like being able to get up and down from a chair or to walk up steps, to be able to have much more functionality in their lives, um, as they get older, particularly because they have been moving their bodies. And so, uh, th- again, I see firsthand evidence of this in people that I know. That is such an important point. And I don't think enough people consider that, especially if they've had like really bad experiences, maybe in a gym or with a workout program, all they think of is like exercise really sucks. <laughs> and it's not that fun to mm-hmm. do. And I don't want to do it. And it's really painful and it's uncomfortable. And I've got such and such yelling at me to do more reps or sets or whatever it is. But really like the point is what you just said, like this is for your enjoyment. This is to have whatever you want from life and, and to be able to enjoy those things. So I think, I think that's such an important and critical point to, to really point out is like, this is for your benefit and you really shouldn't spend a lot of time like doing things that you don't love. Like, yeah, going to the gym might not be that comfortable, but it is to, to make yourself stronger so you can enjoy all the things that you, you know, want to put your time and effort towards. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. So you, you know, said you uncovered some new information. So I'd love to talk about some of the things that you emphasized in the, in your first iteration of the book and some things that you maybe thought now that you maybe overemphasized and maybe some things with new information that you underemphasized, maybe some things you've learned along the way. Hmm, That's a good question. Um, well, uh, I think that one of the things, I mean, I'll just, just pick one example. There's so many examples, but one of the things we often hear about is that you need to take 10,000 steps every day, right? That's sort of a common mantra, one of these rules we often hear. Everybody needs to have 10,000 steps. And and the research that I did, um, I found that there's really no scientific basis for that 10,000 step rule. It, it Interestingly, it came from a maker of a, a Japanese manufacturer of a, of, a pedom- of a pedometer in the 1960s. And the number 10,000 was chosen it's thought because the number 10,000 has exalted status in Japanese culture. So somehow through that, the number uh, 10,000 became a rule that you need to get 10,000 steps. And what I found in my research is that actually uh, that you can take fewer than 10,000 steps a day and still reach the recommended uh the, re- the recommended uh, aerobic requirement meet the uh, recommended aerobic requirements from the government um if you get uh if you get 8000 steps so here's how it breaks down so if you get 5000 steps it's considered sedentary and if you can get at least 3000 steps above that um then you can meet the requirements but there's some important uh, considerations here first of all those steps need to be relatively brisk and number two, they need to be taken in uh, increments of 10 minutes. Now, here, so you ask what has come to the fore since then. So what newer recommendations and newer science is starting to show that is that you may not even need those 10-minute increments. Increments as small as a few minutes may be fine. So the point here is that that's an example of where the original advice is uh, not necessarily based in science. The newer interpretation of that is that you need to take brisk steps and in 10 minute increments, but we're also finding more recently that, you, that the 10 minute rule may not even apply, that any, uh, any amount of exercise, any duration of exercise, if it adds up over time during the day is good. And I think this is an important point because people often talk about exercise snacks. The idea that if you can get small amounts of exercise, even if it's just a few minutes throughout the day, that can add up 
to an effective uh, regimen throughout the day. So that sometimes people say, well, I don't have time to exercise. I'm not going to do anything. And we should think instead of trying to incorporate small amounts of exercise, even if it's a few minutes throughout the day, whenever we can. And so this 10,000 step rule is a good example of how that information is evolving. And it's a good reminder of how uh, we do need to be mindful of getting in uh, movement whenever we can. Yeah, no, that's so practical. And I love that message. I don't think that 10,000 steps is necessarily like a bad idea for sure. It doesn't surprise me at all that it's a manufacturer of a pedometer, you know, 50 years ago that decided to set that rule. And we just kind of followed along with that. No, no surprises there, but you're right. Like I, I found, especially with walking, I, I don't think as much with running, even though that would technically count as steps, but with walking, it's almost like a linear benefit. Like as long as you're not in pain, as long as you're well accustomed to walking, it just seems like the more of it you can squeeze in at any point point, the more beneficial it's almost always going to be again, unless you're overdoing it. Do you find that to be the case? Yeah, absolutely. More is always better. And, but also I think what's important there too, is it's not just the quantity of your steps, but it's the quality of your steps. And by quality, we mean not only briskness, the brisker, the better, if you can walking obviously briskly or at a moderately brisk pace is better than going slowly, uh, but also uh, the terrain. So if you can walk up steps, down steps, uh, to go on hills, uh, whether you're walking outside on a treadmill, that's better than walking on flat surfaces. So yes, both the number of steps, but also the quality of those steps is important. Yeah. I love that. Such a great answer. We really love the idea of minimal effective dosage around here. And so I love the title of your book, fitter faster. Um, and I always thought like, I, you know, I'm a trainer. I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm a nutrition coach. Like I love to work out, right? I love to go to the gym. I love to lift weights. I love to sweat a lot and, and be really active. That's just part of my lifestyle. And as the years go by and I'm getting older, I'm thinking, wait a second. I, I don't like working out at all. Actually, this is really, you know, it's tough. And it, it, you know, I, there's other things I'd rather be doing. There's more productive things I could be doing for work. And I found that I, I found it really beneficial to find what works in the smallest doses that, that gets me the results that I want, that I don't necessarily need to spend hours and hours doing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you look at the minimal effective dosage and how your program might be different from something, say like, you know, five minute abs or something that, you know, is yeah. clearly like a gimmick. Well, I should say, first of all, unlike you, I'm not a personal trainer, so I don't pretend I don't, I don't want to be something I'm not in terms of recommending workout plans to people, but I did team up with a personal trainer named Brad Kolowicz, who's a trainer in Atlanta to come up with this particular plan. Uh, and again, it's not, I'm not, we're not saying it's the only plan or the best plan, but it's one particular approach that can help people do more in less time. And, and it relied on several principles, one of which is this idea of high intensity interval training. And that idea of being, and I'm, and I, I'm sure you've spoken to your listeners about it in the past, the idea of being for Instead of going at a steady state for, say, 30 minutes, you go hard for, say, 30 seconds, and then you go easier for 30 seconds and hard for 30 seconds or an easy. Oh, and it, the duration could be anything. It can be 20 seconds and 10 seconds or one minute and one minute. So there are a lot of variations here. But the point is that you go hard, easy, hard, easy instead of uh, at the same pace for, the same, for, say, 30 minutes. And so that's one way of reducing the time because studies show that high-intensity interval training uh, can result in many of the same benefits in a lot less time. So going for even 10 or 15 minutes um, can have, in many cases, a total can have the same benefits as going 30 or 40 minutes at a steady state. So that's one principle that's uh, embedded in the workouts we have. Another is uh, to go to do circuit training. So instead of doing the traditional kind of training where you do one exercise, take a break, do another set, take a break, do another set, we go through a circuit. And what studies actually have shown that I found were that once one circuit can be very effective, two or three may be more effective, but the most important is to do the first one in terms of getting the most benefit. So uh, going through a circuit of different uh, weight training exercises. And then the third principle is combining aerobic and strength training, exercises that combine the two uh, in, in, a, in one routine. Because you know that the standard recommendation is to do at least five days a week of aerobic activity uh, 30 minutes a day. And then on top of that, to do strength training. And then on top of that, to do uh, work for flexibility, stretching. And so that's a lot. And that's a lot of time. And so the idea here is if you can combine the aerobic and strength training uh, into exercises or single sessions, uh, and then include some flexibility in there, we can save time. And that's, again, uh, num uh, I don't have time is the number one reason people cite as to why they don't exercise. And so what we've tried to do here is lower that barrier uh, allow people to do this in less time. 
Yeah, I love that. I mean, one of the praises for your book was that you're basically removing all the excuses for somebody to get fit. Um, and I think that is actually like really, really important um, to be able to combine those things and get the most out of the least amount of time so somebody can be really effective. I, I really love that approach. This is going to be maybe a three-part question. You write about this in your book, um, but the first part would be, in what ways is exercise important for us? The second part of the question would be, what what are some of the surprising things that, that exercise is really important for us that a lot of people wouldn't consider? And maybe in what ways is exercise really overrated where people think, I'm exercising, I should see X benefit, but that benefit never actually comes comes because it's not really truly associated with all the work that they're doing. Great question. So I'll take each of the parts. So first of all, with regard to why it's good for us, um, I like to say if there were a pill, they could do all the extra things that exercise can do. We'd be clamoring for it. I mean, because there's nothing, no pill comes close or ever will come close to all the things to do to all the things that exercise can do. We're talking about it and we're familiar with many of these. We hear them all the time. It can help us live longer. It can improve our heart health. Um, reduces risk of certain kinds of cancer, um, <clears throat> helps reduce uh, the risk of depression, um, helps reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And also, we discussed this earlier, helps uh, ward off what uh, sort of older age feebleness. So uh, if, as people get older, bones, joints, muscles um, tend to get weaker. And so the idea is that exercise can help slow uh, the loss of muscle and bone and, and, and help maintain joint health. So all those things exercise can do, we know about. So those are the things we know about. And the list goes on in terms of those things. But in terms of surprising things, and again, these were things that I was happy to learn in doing my research for the book. Um, just I'll mention just a few. Uh, there's evidence that exercise can help people's sex lives. So it's sort of in men, it sort of acts as a natural Viagra. In women, it helps uh, improve sexual arousal. Um, exercise can help improve your sleep. Uh, it, can, it can reduce the risk of colds. Um, it can help, and here's a surprise, when your eyesight, uh, people who exercise regularly have lower risk of cataracts uh, and what's known as age-related macular degeneration, which is a leading cause of blindness as people get older. Uh, it can help reduce the risk of hearing loss uh, and even help our bathroom habits. So uh, it's just to be sort of gross, it can help with regard to uh, men having to get up at night or with regard to constipation. So just help improve your bathroom habits as well. Um, so all those things people may not be aware of, um, exercise can certainly do that. It also, of course, as anybody who exercises regularly knows, can just help you feel better emotionally, help improve your mood, help reduce stress. So um, uh, all those things exercise can do. Um, with regard to what it cannot do, uh, and this is a very important point, you know, many of us, despite all those benefits, what we look exercise to do for us first and foremost is to help us lose weight. And here's the one thing that exercise doesn't do so well to actually help us shed pounds. And that's simply because the kind of exercise that most of us do, which is to, uh, to go for a walk, uh, take a yoga class, ride a bike, uh, all of which are fantastic things to do for your health and fantastic in terms of having all the benefits I just described, those things don't burn a lot of calories. So what it means is if uh, you're going for a walk, you're not gonna burn that many calories. And so therefore not to, you're not gonna make that big a dent in your weight. Um, and unfortunately, though, people often look to exercise to do this for them. As I say, first and foremost, they find that exercise is not helping them. And so they give up on exercise. And that's completely sort of the wrong way to look at things. Um, uh, I think, as I've said, I, we need to look at exercise in a holistic way in terms of how it improves our lives, and improves our health. Um, with regard to weight, I will say that exercise does have some weight-related benefits. It can help you keep off weight that you've lost or keep you from gaining weight in the first place. It can also reduce fat, particularly visceral fat. That's the kind of fat around the waist that's thought to be particularly harmful. So it does have weight-related benefits, but with regard to actually helping you shed pounds, which is often what people care about the most when it comes to weight, it doesn't do so uh, such a good job at that. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind as we think about why we're exercising. Yeah, that's so critical. I'm so glad you made that point. And I'm really glad you talked about different intensities in your book. I was fortunate enough to work on a metabolic cart for over a decade in my career, which means we could measure you know, people's metabolisms or, or basically how they're using calories, not only when they're resting, but also when they're exercising. And we would just put people on a treadmill or a bike or whatever and ramp up their intensity as they were exercising. And what we'd notice is definitely linear. The harder they worked out, the more and more calories that they would burn. But our metabolic carts were pretty cool because they would show us the exchange ratio between the 
oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is more related to where the calories are coming from. Are you burning fat as fuel or are you burning carbohydrates or sugar as fuel? And what we would learn is if you were working at an easy intensity, yes, you would be taking a very high percentage of your calories from fat as long as you had a normal and healthy metabolism that wasn't screwed up by eating tons and tons of sugar all the time. But the problem is you wouldn't be burning very many calories when you did it. If you worked out at a higher intensity, you would definitely be burning a lot of calories. But if you push that a little too far, you would be burning all of those calories from carbohydrates. And so we would find this like really nice sweet spot where you would be burning, uh, you know, a moderate to high amount of calories with most of those calories coming from fat. And that's what most people wanted to see is where can I maximize my fat burn? So I'm not just losing weight, but I'm actually targeting and burning off fat. And so I'm really glad that you address that in the book that there are different intensities and it's important to understand, you know, too easy is probably too easy and too hard is probably too hard. Right. And the trick there, of course, is that it's going to vary from person to person and not everybody's going to have access to the technology to tell them. So often what happens is people are guessing based on either a formula or looking at the uh, fat burning zone on a machine, on a cardio machine or whatever the case may be. And unless they go to an exercise physiologist or work with someone like you who can actually uh, tell them exactly where they need to be, uh, they're guessing and they end up, may not end up achieving their goals and getting frustrated. Right. And you, you included some of those like formulas and things like that in the book and talked about like the pros and cons of including them. And some are valid for this, but not as valid for that, which I totally agree with. But you also addressed what I would consider like rate of perceived exertion. Like how hard do you feel like you're working? And I, you and I totally agree. It's somewhere in that middle ground where you can ask somebody, how hard do you feel like you're working on a scale of one to 10? And typically speaking, what I noticed by using all the technology is just using that simple one to 10 method. If somebody's working around a five or a six out of 10 for difficulty, they're typically maxing out their fat burn. And so that's a really nice kind of poor man's way of determining like, you know, is my intensity really working for me or am I working too hard or too easy? So I'm really glad that you included that in the book so people can get a sense of that regardless of whether they have a heart rate monitor or access to some of that metabolic testing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you discuss off-ramps in your book, and I wonder, what do you mean when you're talking about off-ramps and how can we avoid them? Right. Well, when I talk about off-ramps, I'm talking about all the things, all, we all experience these things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives that will derail us in some way, keep us from exercising, whether it is work responsibilities, family responsibilities, illness, dealing with family emergencies, uh, dealing with hectic schedules, whatever the case may be things that keep us from, uh, sort of get us off track when it comes to exercise. And this happens to all of us. And so what I try to talk about in the book, again, when I talk about barrier lowering workouts, things you can do to stay on track, which of course, you know, many people they, with great intention start an exercise program and after a few weeks or a few months or whatever, get off track and, and, and can't really get back on track. So the idea here is what can you do to stay on track? And so, you know, I've listed some things that can help people do that. Um, based on studies. Um, one is the idea of treating exercise like an appointment so that uh, just as you would a meeting, a business meeting or a child soccer game or whatever it is, things you have to be at, put it on your calendar and schedule it so that you know you're going to do it at a certain time uh, on certain days. And I think that's really important because if you think of exercise as something you just squeeze in when you have time, of course, it's not going to get done regularly. I also think with regard to this, it's important to be realistic, right? So if you're a morning person, great. You can schedule in the morning, but if you're not a morning person, don't assume you're going to get up at six o'clock and go to the gym. I know I'm not a morning person. I, I tend to prefer exercising in the afternoon or evenings. And so it would be unrealistic of me to think that I was for any length of time going to be able to get up at six in the morning and go to the gym. Um, but also need to be realistic. If you've got family responsibilities, dinner, kids, whatever to after work, don't think you're going to get to the gym either. So I think again, if it's a matter of finding the time to do it, that's going to work for you. Um, Another uh, idea is to make it more enjoyable. Pick activities that you uh, like or at least don't hate. So if you don't like running on a treadmill, if you don't like running, don't run. I mean, there's no reason to do things that you don't like to do because, again, if you choose activities you dislike, you're not going to continue with exercise. So find things, that, as I said, that you like or at least don't hate. So that whether that's walking or hiking or swimming or dancing or going to a yoga class or, or whatever it may be, find things that you're uh, going to be able to continue. And then do things while you're exercising that you enjoy. That could be listening to music. It, if you work out inside, it could be watching a show on Netflix. Um, or whatever the case may be, try to find things that you enjoy. And part of that can't, might be working out with other people. So to find a workout buddy or go to a class 
um, if that's something that is available to you. So that can make exercise more enjoyable as well. Um, and then also um, think about rewarding yourself so that when you reach a certain goal, um, do something for yourself that you wouldn't usually do. Go on, go on a vacation, uh, go to a concert, get a massage, whatever it may be that you'll enjoy that, that rewards you for reaching a certain goal. Um, it shouldn't be food. That's not a good idea. But uh, any, any other activity or, uh, that you enjoy, I think, is important to recognize your accomplishment. Um, and then I think long term, something that can really help is to, and, and it takes time to do this, but I think it's something that we can all strive for, is to turn exercise into something over time that you want to do rather than you have to do. And certainly that's not easy. And it's not something when people are beginning exercise, they're necessarily going to be able to do. But that involves focusing on the short-term benefits, the immediate benefits of exercise. How does it make you feel after you exercise? Do you feel less stressed? Do you feel like that you can sleep better? Do you feel you're more able to deal with a stressful job? Are you able to better to deal with your kids? Um, do, you, uh, do, do, do you do you feel better overall? Do you feel more empowered? To focus on how it makes you feel immediately. Because, you know, thinking about, oh, well, this is, I should do this because I'm going to be at a lower risk of a heart attack in 30 years is not going to necessarily keep you going from day to day to day. So if you focus on how it makes you feel now, you can then eventually think about exercise as something you actually want to do rather than something you have to do because you're going to feel better. And I think that ultimately is the goal, something to work toward over time to keep you going, to keep motivating you um, so that you really say, okay, I really want to go to the gym today. I want to go out and walk today because I know I'm going to feel good. Yeah, that's such a great point. I love that. I always feel like, you know, doing a strength training workout or doing something that, you know, maybe it is challenging and, and that challenge is a little bit uncomfortable. It always makes me feel more resilient for the true challenges in life. If I'm deliberately putting myself through something that's, you know, challenging to me, maybe it's a cold temperature, maybe it's a, a weight that's a little bit uncomfortable, but I'm getting through it. That just makes me feel stronger for, for when I have to do, you know, accounting or I have to have a difficult conversation over the phone or something like that. It makes me feel stronger to do those things. I'm sure most people notice that a lot of this stuff is really reminding me of, of the work of James Clear in Atomic Habits and like really doing some habit stacking, mixing your flexibility work with some of your strength training and combining cardio. It's like combining some of these things. And I think a lot of it is getting people, you know, a small win here and there, because I'm, I'm sure you've noticed the same thing. There seems to be this really strong inertia and it works both ways. It works like an inertia towards unhealth, which is, you know, you skip a day, then it's easier to eat a cake and then it's easier to move the workout program to next Monday. And then you don't do it then. And then you gain 10 pounds and it's even, you know, more uncomfortable to even start moving again. But there is an inertia that works the other way. It's almost like an upward spiral where if it's uncomfortable to walk around the block, just start with that. And then you'll notice that you maybe feel a little better. And then maybe you'll be more inclined to eat better food and get more sleep and, and things like that. Is that something you've noticed as well? Absolutely. And I think that's a great way to put it, this inertia that works in both directions. And so I think once people, and you say it's establishing habits. So once it becomes a habit, once it becomes just part of your routine, it's something that you don't want to stop because you know you won't feel as good, that you'll, you won't feel as good if you stop doing it. And so it becomes, and I know that's happened for me. I mean, the story of my life here and my life in fitness is that I was one of those kids growing up who hated to uh, sweat. You know, I would always prefer to sit on the couch. I didn't, and if you told me I had to go out and run or, 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 or uh, do anything that was physically exert, exerting myself physically, I wouldn't want to do it. But over time, I discovered how exercise made me feel better. And now in my life, in middle age, I can't imagine how I would feel if I didn't have movement as part of my life. I, I know that it's something I would, I would never want to part with because I wouldn't feel as good. And so uh, I think, as I like to say, if I can discover this and I can incorporate it in my life, anybody can. And I think, as you say, once people do, they recognize how it's something that they want to continue. Yeah, I love that. I, you mentioned doing what you love earlier, and I think reframing that is so important. Like, does you know hiking up a 2,000-foot mountain sign sound really enjoyable to you? Maybe not, but does getting out in nature and being outside and looking at birds and flowers and all these interesting things that are growing in the life that's happening, that might be more interesting and that might make you forget about, you know, going on a more difficult hike. You're just outside, you know, in appreciating some of the things that you don't appreciate while you're inside, you know, doing nothing, sitting on the couch. So I think that reframe is super important. And on that note, I would love to ask, would you rather somebody exercise indoors or be outdoors or does it really matter? Well, I think there is evidence that being outdoors can help. And for some of the reasons you said, it doesn't have to be sort of with beautiful vistas and scenic uh, areas. Just being outside, having sort of the sights and sounds of outdoors, uh, studies show can actually help 
increase the enjoyment of exercise. But of course, that's not always possible because of maybe where people live, because it's too hot, because it's too cold, it's too rainy, whatever the case. And so I think in the end, it's just a matter of of getting physical activity wherever you can. And that can be all kinds of places. It could be not only a gym, it could be going to a mall and walking there. You know, there are all kinds of different options if, 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 not, if it's not outside. Uh, but the point is that if you can get outside, if the weather is conducive to allowing you to exercise, to be outside, the studies do show that can increase the enjoyment of your uh, activity. Excellent. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Any opportunity we get to be outside, we take advantage of that. And I, I totally agree with you. There's something a little bit more magical about, about being out there. There's something almost you can't explain. Maybe it's the air, maybe it's the sunlight. Something just feels more refreshing when you are outside. So I totally agree with that. Although I wouldn't argue with anybody, you know, with their circumstances working out indoors, if that's what they have, it's totally fine. Um, so we've already talked about HIT workouts, high intensity interval training. We've talked a little bit about, you know, lighter to, to moderate kind of um, exercise. As far as aerobic conditioning goes, what should we be thinking about as far as balancing our aerobic conditioning? So I think it's important to remember, again, what the standard guidelines are to do it uh, are five days a week, at least five days a week, 30 minutes a day of steady state. Um, and I think it's important to balance both steady state and HIIT. Uh, and here's the reason. Most of the research we have in terms of the uh, cardiovascular benefits of aerobic activity are around steady state. So um, that's where we, we've, there've been decades and decades of research showing that, that there are benefits there. There's less research around the cardiovascular benefits of HIT. There certainly are there, which is why I've recommended it and why a lot of experts recommend it now, but we don't have as much science. The science is emerging. It's, there's more and more all the time, but the, the tried and true uh, sort of approach is to have steady state. So I believe and what I've recommended, and Brad, my co-author, has recommended is to have a mix of steady state to include some steady state and then also to do some hit in your, in your workouts with regard to aerobic to, to achieve aerobic benefits. Um, and, and whether that's you know one day of a week of hit or two days or how many ever days it is, along with other things. But again, the beauty of doing steady state aerobic activity is that there are so many options. You whether you can bike, you can do uh, walking, you can do hiking, you can do swimming. There, there's so many different uh, ways to do uh, this traditional steady state aerobic activity. So having that balance there. And then with regard to balancing that with strength training, again, it's important to make sure that you include some strength training. You know, so many people, we know, you know, that, that, that exercise regularly um, do a fantastic job when it comes to aerobic activity, but they have little if any strength training. And I think that's a mistake. It's very important to think of the two as equally important and to include both. Now, I know different experts will say, uh, we'll talk about the difference in terms of proportion, how much strength versus how much aerobic activity you should do. And I think that's all dependent on your goals. Um, but I do think it's the, the key here is it's important to do both. Yeah, I agree. And I'm so excited to talk about strength training with you. Before we leave the cardio, I'm, I'm curious to know, in your mind, do you have like a percentage split that you would like to see people do between, um, you know, more of the steady state versus more of the high intensity? Is, is there kind of a general rule of thumb that somebody should be shooting for as far as like a percentage of time that they're dedicating to each one of those? Um, there is not a rule of thumb. And you may, I'd be interested in what, what your recommendation is. There's none that I've seen in the literature, again, because the the uh, science on HIT is still emerging, but I would say um, my I think you know generally is to do uh, one or two days a week of HIT, and then uh, one or two days a week of steady state. At least that's what I do, and that's I think what we've recommended. But again, I think that's all should be individualized based on what your preferences are and based on what your goals are. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. I don't have anything to base the science on. I just kind of have in my mind like an 80-20 rule, almost like 80% more of the steady state or like if you're going to do, you know, two days of each, maybe the, the steady state is a little bit longer as far as time and the shorter, you know, intervals could be those high intensity intervals. And again, I just think it goes back to doing something that you really love. Like if you told me that every week I had to do, you know, a, a, a high intensity interval on a bike, which I love cycling or, you know, on a treadmill or something, I would absolutely hate it. Yet it's no problem for me to wake up at four in the morning every Wednesday and drag my hockey stuff to the rink and skate hard with my buddies for an hour and a half, which is very high, in, high intensity. And that that's just like really enjoyable, even though, you know, they're talking trash to me all the time and we're talking smack back and forth. It's like that, that's really fun and engaging to me. And I think more people would be served like finding that really enjoyable thing that you can push the intensity up, take a 
recover, repeat it several times, I, that, that enjoyment piece is just so, so critical in my mind for something that will really keep people on track for doing the stuff that feels really, really more difficult. I think that's cr- absolutely true. That's crucial. And I think the other part here is the amount of time you have, because if you only have 15 minutes uh, on most days of the week, then it might make more sense if you don't mind doing it, if you can do it to squeeze more hit in. So that way, if you don't have 30 minutes or 45 minutes um, over the course of a day to get in your aerobic activity, maybe hit might be a better option. But again, if it's, if it's, if you enjoy the steady state more and don't like the hit, then it would totally make sense to do the more of the steady state. Gotcha. Very practical and very easy to individualize based on, you know, what somebody likes. I really like that approach. In your book, you tell a very familiar story about yourself maybe 20 years ago going back and thinking like strength training. Why would I do strength training? I don't want to look like a bodybuilder. There's so many um, negative connotations about strength training and this idea that if we lift weights, we're going to get massive, we're going to get bulky and nobody, not nobody, but most people don't really appreciate that look. Yet more of us, I, I think, need to be doing more strength training than we do. So why is strength training so important? It's important because it, it not only has this, some of the same benefits as aerobic activity, and this is often surprises people. It, it, it actually helps improve heart health. It increase, decreases the risk of diabetes, but it has benefits that aerobic activity does not have. Uh, specifically, it helps um, slow the loss of muscle mass as we get older. So that's very important for the reasons we discussed earlier. As people tend to lose muscle mass, they tend to get more feeble as they get older. Um, so that's so that's one particularly important role that uh, strength training plays is to maintain muscle mass. And, and, and that's important for so many reasons in terms of our overall health, as I said, as we get older, particularly. Um, and then it also has benefits with regard to it, it may have, in some cases, even greater benefits with regard to reducing body fat, um, maintaining a good body composition so that it, even if people don't lose weight, strength training can be very important for uh, body composition. Um, so, uh, it's something again, that's often overlooked in terms of its importance. And, you know, you know, something you often hear is that women say, well, I don't want to look like a bodybuilder. You know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I, that's not right for me, but strength training is uh, important equally for men and women. And, and too often women don't do it because they feel that it's something just men do, but that's a myth as well. And so it's important for people of, um, men and women, as well as people uh, young and old to do. Yeah. When I, when I think back on my gym days, there was, you know, a section of the gym that was more the cardio section. There was a section of the gym that was more the weight section. And I definitely think the people that got the best results, I would see in both sections at different times doing different things. But I would generally notice that if somebody was spending most, if not all of their time on the, on the cardio section, they would typically not really change the shape of their body. They might you know, lose weight and you could kind of notice that, but the aesthetic never really changed. There were maybe like a bigger or smaller iteration of that person, give or take like maybe 10 or 20 pounds. But it seemed like the people who were more focused on the weight, they would literally change their shapes, men and women in different ways. And I think the hormones are so important to determine where we gain muscle and how we burn fat in certain ways. But I would definitely say that when I would notice body composition changes, it was more on the strength training side of things versus the cardio side of things. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that's my experience. Absolutely. Personally. So I was a runner for many years for, I'd say for 20 years, I was a runner and I almost never went to the gym to lift any weights. And when I started lifting weights within a few months, maybe two months, I started seeing changes in my body composition. So I was somebody who was quote in shape before I was not overweight, but I was in shape from running, but my body pretty much stayed the same, but it wasn't until I started working out in the gym with weights that I saw a difference there. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody who's ever watched a race like a half marathon or full marathon, you see people finishing and it's amazing that you see every different body type. People can go extreme distances, you know, in every different body type, which is completely great. It's awesome. And I think they did a study. I want to say it was the the Cape Cape Town, um, I want to say marathon where they looked at the BMI of all the participants of, of, of this particular marathon. And it pretty much exactly matched the population BMI. And so it wasn't to say like doing a ton, a ton of cardio was going to really help you as far as the weight, like we talked about earlier, but, but really incorporating the strength training along with really smart cardio training was what you really needed to change your body composition. Like you said, that, that it's really cool that you notice that, especially with running as much as you did. I think one thing that's really intimidating for people is, you know, if we're looking at the cardio, we're talking about hit, we're talking about steady state. There's a few variables that we can change and we need to be mindful of for sure. But once we go over to the weights, we have a lot 
of variables. What exercises are we going to choose? How many sets? How many reps? What is the intensity? What's the volume? What's the frequency? How many days a week do I need to be doing this? Am I doing some kind of split? Am I working total body? You know, all of those things come into play. I'm wondering if you have some very, very, very high level kind of general principles that people can keep in mind when they're thinking about strength training. Yeah, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, I, again, I can speak from experience on this because a lot, one of the reasons I never started uh, working out with weights or it took me so long was that I found it to be, I didn't know what to do. And also I found it intimidating. You go to a gym, you see these pieces of equipment, you're not sure exactly how to use them correctly. Um, and, and also I, there's this whole idea of gym intimidation. It's sometimes called that. It's just, it's intimidating. You see these people who are in shape or working out and they seem to know what you're doing, they're doing, and you don't know what you're doing and you're afraid you're going to look silly. So I think that's something that's really tough in terms of starting this and, and, and starting to do this. So I would say, first of all, you don't have to go to a gym. You can, you, there's no, there, there's no reason you have to go to a gym. So you can do this at home. If you're not comfortable going to a gym, you can do uh, strength training at home. Um, you can start with body weight exercises. We're talking push-ups, squats, planks, things like that. Um, and you can use household objects. You can use, uh, you know, water jugs and cans, and or you can use resistance bands. Um, but I think the key is to know how to do the exercises properly. And for that, if you're able to go to a class or to hire a personal trainer, I think at least at the beginning, it's important to do that. If you're not able to do that, then there are lots of good videos online just to sort of see how to do, to learn how to do the exercises properly. Because not only does that help you uh, prevent injuries, but also it gives you greater confidence so that you know what you're doing. And that certainly was the case for me. I hired a personal trainer. So it gave me per greater confidence, not only to do those exercises, but also to continue trying new exercises because I had a greater sense of empowerment that I, that, that I was less intimidated. So I think those the, sort of getting proper instruction, however you do it is important. And then thinking beyond the gym, if the gym is not your thing, thinking of other ways, other places you can work out. Totally, totally, totally agree. I may have disagreed with you um, a little over two years ago when we were all working out and working at gyms, but guess what? Like 2020 changed all of the rules and there are so, so many resources out there for people to use. Like you said, household objects. I can program workouts with people using water bottles. I In this last two years, I've trained people on the banister of their stairs with a band. Like there's no limitation and no rules about how you can get really, really great results and you absolutely absolutely do not need a gym. You could find rocks outside. You could go to a playground and do all kinds of fun stuff and fun movements. And, and you're absolutely right. I'm glad you made that point that a gym is not critical, especially in this day and age of zoom, uh, you know, videos on YouTube. There's so many different ways you can get that really good instruction and pay attention to form with an absolutely very minimal or no amount of equipment. I'm really glad you made that point. Uh, most of us know that that exercise is super important, but we also can't really outrun a bad diet. And we've already talked about this when we talked about weight loss. What are some of the principles you like to highlight when it comes to diet? What should people be thinking of, uh, you know, rather than being really dogmatic about following X diet, what are some of the general guidelines that pe people can be thinking of that can generally get them success? So I have, I sort of, in this book, I've talked about general principles. And again, every diet is going to be different. It depends on your goals, depends on your situation. So I don't think there's a one size fits all sort of plan here with regard to how you should eat. Uh, but I do think there's some general principles. One is when you're uh, doing exercises to think about um, getting protein at every meal. You know, you, people often hear about, okay, you need to get, you know, you need to uh, load up on protein right after you exercise. There's some controversy about the timing of it, about whether you actually need to get protein right after your workout um, or your a strength training workout. But the point is that you, the more general rule to remember is you need to get adequate protein in your diet. And so um, a good rule of thumb for most people is to get the number of grams of protein is, is just divide your weight into. So if you weigh 150, to, folk, to, to aim for, to shoot for 75 grams of protein. Now, that's higher than the official recommendation. It's lower than what people who are, who are doing, uh, who are really going to sort of improve their physique or doing more competitive activities might, they might go for as high as uh, one gram per pound. Um, so it's sort of a compromise, but I think a good rule of thumb for most people is to divide your weight into and, and aim for that number of grams of protein throughout the day. So you don't have to load up, you know, most of them right after you work out. It's just a matter of getting that number of grams of protein throughout the day. So enough protein is important. Uh, focus on complex carbohydrates. Those are things like uh, whole grains, uh, fruits, vegetables, beans, as opposed to refined carbs, things like 
uh, chips, uh, you know, sweets, packaged foods. So to sort of focus on the complex carbs, um, focus on getting um, good fats in the diet as opposed to uh, uh, the fats that are considered not as healthy. So good fats would be things from things like fatty fish, olive oil, nuts, seeds. Um, and then when it comes to, to beverages, um, think about drinking water mainly. Um, you know, we, there are a lot of uh, sports drinks out there, Gatorade and all the rest tell you you need to drink those after you work out. Um, that they have so-called electrolytes. For most of us, the kind of exercise we do, we don't need to replenish electrolytes after we work out. So those kinds of drinks are not really necessary. In some cases, they have lots of sugar. Um, so uh, that's not necessarily, we don't really necessarily need to eat after we work out either. I know that, you know, there's a lot of talk about athletes needing to replace um, uh, glycogen, those stored carbohydrate after they work out. Again, if you work out really intensely, if you're a competitive athlete, if you work out for an hour or more, you may need to do that. But again, for most of us, we don't necessarily need to uh, eat more or eat anything after exercise. If you do, if you are hungry, you can eat a light snack, but you need to be careful because a lot of times what happens if people are focused on their weight, what happens is they uh, exercise, they think, oh, I need to get a snack after I work out. And then they end up actually consuming more calories overall. So that's something uh, to be aware of as well. Um, and then finally, just to be wary of claims on foods. You know, a lot of foods have health halos on them, uh, things like uh, multigrain, gluten-free, vitamin fortified, and foods that are uh, energy bars that are aimed at people who are exercising. Again, you need to sort of read labels carefully, look beyond these health halos, because a lot of these foods that claim to be exercise friendly or claim to be good for your health really are not. They may be high in sugar and they may be high in calories. And so you need to sort of look at that ingredient label and that nutrition label really carefully before you uh, fall for these sort of health halo claims. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> those claims are just a really good way for those companies to make a lot of money, in my opinion. Um, mostly just filled with garbage and filler ingredients and make all these claims that are absolutely not substantiated by any kind of science that I can see. I think those recommendations are fantastic. You know, around here, we have had a lot of success getting people on lower carbohydrate diets. We focus a lot on animal heavy, you know, diets with a lot of animal proteins and things like that. And we found that that works pretty well for most people. I'm not saying that's the only way to go, but I do like your protein recommendation. Like I would, I would love to see that as a, a bare bones like minimum and, and if somebody can get more i would love that but you're right like that recommendation of take your weight and half it is probably way less than what most people are being told to get and what they're actually even getting where most people are overloading themselves with all kinds of empty carbohydrates they're just hungry all the time the bag of chips is never going to fill people up and it has no nutrients it has none of the protein it's got none of the things your body needs so you're going to continue consuming and soon consuming those foods seeking the nutrients that you're never going to get so i think staying very well balanced that way is really smart and and making protein the first focus. I'm glad it's the first thing you talked about because I, I completely agree. If you're getting a decent amount of protein, I think the rest of you know the things you consume will kind of sort themselves out and people can have their preferences and see what makes them feel good and what makes them not feel good to decide what can fill out the diet. You mentioned hydration, which I think is super important. And you specifically say in the being in the book, drink but not to excess. Can you explain why? So many people are probably over consuming water when they're exercising versus under consuming. That's a big misconception. I don't think a lot of people understand. Yeah. So this idea that we hear all the time is you need to sort of stay ahead of your thirst and keep drinking during exercise. And what, uh, you know, what the science shows is that there is a risk. It's not huge, but there is a risk of, of a condition called hyponatremia. And what that means is essentially it's water intoxication. You, people drink so much water, and this happens most often during marathons. People drink so much water, they're constantly chugging water while they're running, that essentially their sodium level drops too low. And this can be a potentially life-threatening condition. And people have died from this. And so, and it's, it's, and it's happened also with other activities as well. Um, so the idea here is that the best idea is to let thirst be your guide um, and to drink when you're thirsty. Now, obviously, if you're out in sort of very hot, humid weather, or if you're doing really in, intensive exercise, you need to make sure you drink enough. You need to be careful. People who are older sometimes need to be extra careful to make sure they get enough water because their sense of thirst might not be as acute. But nevertheless, generally for most healthy people, the best approach is to drink when you're thirsty. And this idea that you have to keep forcing yourself to chug water, whether you're thirsty or not, continuously throughout exercise um, again, is potentially a problem because it can lead to this condition, as I mentioned, hyponatremia. 
Yep. Um, uh, Professor Tim Noakes covers this extensively in his book, Waterlogged. Uh, and I, again, I think this is really important. I think this is why it is so important to at least be thoughtful about your electrolyte consumption. If you're thinking about electrolytes and you're thinking about things like you know, those sport drinks you mentioned, like Gatorade, um, you know, tons of sugar, maybe not very many electrolytes, like they say. And, you know, they've reformulated over the years to just get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and have less, less of those electrolytes. But if, if we think about the water we were probably consuming for most of our evolution, we were probably consuming spring water water that already had a, you know, a pretty rich source of minerals that could help balance our electrolytes and, and keep our sodium intact so that we were retaining more of the water that we needed for proper circulation and all those other things. And so I think, I think that not overhydrating and also being mindful of taking in enough electrolytes are, are really, really critical. So I'm glad you addressed that in the book. Um, I do want to talk about um, the actual plan. So can you tell us how the Fitter Faster plan looks and, and how that balances you know all of the different components that you said, how you kind of spread those out during a, a typical week or a typical month? Sure. So um, what we have basically is a seven day plan. One day is a rest day. And I think that's really important to remember is you do, we do need rest if, if it's important. And that rest doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit on the couch. It can mean that you sort of take a leisurely stroll or do something else, but it means that you're not doing a full workout. And that's important for the body to recover. Um, so that's an important principle we have here. But it generally, it's, it's, it's so the other six days, there's something different each day. So for example, uh, uh, there are, are two days a week, there's a strength circuit. So we talked earlier about circuits. So you go through strength training and there's a circuit that you do there. Um, one day, uh, two days a week, there's HIT, And one day there's a sort of hit where you choose any activity. So your choice, whether it's running or cycling or rowing, stair climbing, whatever, and do a HIT workout. The other day is um, we have a, what, we, what are called plyometric exercises, which are essentially explosive movements that you do. Um, and then one day a week is conventional cardio, and then one day is your choice. So what's important, and I think a key principle in the outline we have here is there's a lot of choice. And as we said earlier, choice is crucial because you want to be able to pick activities that you're going to enjoy and to be able to keep doing. So there, there are lots of options here in terms of ways to uh, find things to tailor the workout for you within this framework. Um, there's also variety. So there's something different each day. And I think that's important for several reasons. First of all, um, to avoid overuse injuries. So when you do the same thing day after day after day, you can uh, increase the chance of injuries. Um, and so there's, there's variety for that reason, um, but also just to mix it up so you don't get bored. And I think that's important. So you have something different every day. Um, uh, and again, it's customizable in the sense that it can be tailored to your level. So we have beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. Recognizing that when it comes to cardio, maybe you're advanced, but when it comes to strength training, you're a beginner or, or just the opposite. So, so that each type of activity can be tailored according to where you are and then allows you to move forward. And then a final principle is, um, is that when it comes to strength training, we vary the number of reps. So again, it's not the same. It's not the standard, you know, 10 to 12 reps of this exercise. So we um, use a principle called periodization, which means that you um, are constantly changing the number of reps. And again, that's sort of to, to help um, keep the body on its toes, as it were. And studies do show that this kind of approach can help um, improve your gains with regard to strength and, 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 and muscle. Well, as a personal trainer who can barely count to 12, um, that part was a little confusing to me. On some of these sets, I've got to count to 20. That's a real challenge. I'm going to have to take my shoes off, <laughs> shoes and socks, to be able to do that with my clients. <laughs> do you find that variety helps um, keep your people really motivated and keep them on track? I think a lot of people get really bored with workout programs and they lose interest really quickly. Have you noticed that that kind of variety and customization and all those different options keeps people on track and keeps them motivated? I do, because I think it's easy to get in a rut and do the same thing over and over and over and get bored. I know that's certainly true for me. And so I, I know that I found that if I can <clears throat> find ways to mix things up and change things around and not do the same thing every day, um, it, it, it helps to keep me going. That's great. So when we're kind of designing a program for somebody, we're thinking about different movements, like, you know, how can we do a pushing movement in the lower body? How can we do a pulling movement in the lower, lower, in the lower body? Excuse me. How can we, um, you know, push something in front of us using our chest or pull something towards us using our back muscles. And you incorporate a lot of those different movements in the plan, which I love. Um, and, but, but within that, there's lots of different ways that you can do that. And you describe different levels, basic, intermediate, and more advanced. How does somebody know when they need to stick with the more basic iteration? 
variations, like maybe just a simple body weight squat as a lower body kind of pushing exercise versus something that's a little bit more complex or, you know, adding more of that variety, which is maybe like, you know, a reverse lunge with a press or something that, that takes a little bit more skill and coordination. Yeah, I think it's important to assume uh, you're at the lower, at the beginner level, if you're not sure, to sort of start with that and to master that. So if it's just a squat, to master doing the squat and to, and to feel comfortable doing that before you move up. And, and we say that if you move up and you are struggling with it or you can't complete all the reps, then to go back down to the previous level until you can, and then you move back up. So I think what's important there is it's a matter of not only can you complete the reps and to do them in a way that you feel comfortable, um, but, uh, you know, do you, do you feel confident that you can do it? And if you have any concerns, I think it's important to err on the side of caution. Now, obviously the key here is that you're doing this on your own. Now, if somebody were working out with you as a personal trainer, they might take a different approach because you're there to help make sure that they can do it and to encourage them. Maybe if they aren't quite able to do it, to help get them through it. But if you don't have the benefit of a personal trainer, somebody there with you, I think it's important to err on the side of caution and for you to feel totally confident that you can do the movement before you move to something that's more complex. Totally agree. I have definitely shifted more and more towards being way more conservative in the course of my career with the exercises that we give people and making sure they're mastering really basic movements before moving on, adding weight, adding load, adding complexity. I just think the risk of injury versus the reward and benefit is so critical to take into account. And if, if somebody gets injured, you know, doing some of these movements and they're out for a few weeks, you could derail a person for months or even years, depending on how severe that exercise is and what happens with, with all all the other you know parts of the body, how they're eating, how all that changes over time. So I think I think starting basic, giving people small wins, and then advancing slowly over time is such a better way to approach that. So I love that answer. I'm, I'm really curious, having had this book out for a few years and now rewriting it, is there any particular like success story that really stands out? Somebody that wrote to you and and told you about how much they loved the plan and um, you know really appreciated the way you you kind of put things forward in the book. I have. I've had in people that have told me this that I've, I've encountered. And I think that the thing that they have told me is they feel that it's doable. And that to me is the greatest sort of compliment I could get. Because again, for all the reasons we've discussed, so many people see exercise as something that's very daunting. And they look at exercises, it's either too hard, or I can't do this, or I'm intimidated by it. And they've told me that when they tried to do to follow the recommendation of the book, they found that it was very doable. And, and I, I like hearing that because that's ultimately my goal here is to make exercise more doable for people, less daunting, more doable. And, um, and so that more of us can do it and more of us can keep doing it. I love that answer. And I'm glad you take that as a compliment because I consider that some of the highest praise, all of this stuff can be such a quagmire and such a mess. And again, people getting lost on the internet and social media and what, you know, Joe says down the street and what the bro science is, you know, on different websites and to be able to, you know, bring this down into a level that people can comprehend and really understand. There's a lot of really general principles that can be individualized, but it's also things that will, that will give people lots of success. And it really is very simple to understand. It's a book that's really easy to digest. And I really appreciate the way that you wrote it and rewrote it. And, um, yeah, I think it's a great tool and something that can bring a lot of benefit for people. I'm wondering if you had one simple thing that somebody could take away from this conversation one real standout thing that they could apply in their lives, what would that be? I would say to think of, if, if you don't like exercise, if you're like me, if you hate to sweat, or if you think of exercise as something that, you know, is, as I say, sort of drudgery, um, dread, and dislike, the three Ds, I would say that people sort of associate with exercise, is to sort of think about think about reframing to look at this, try to look at this differently, and to think of exercise as we've been saying, earlier as something that's going to, it, it is, don't even think of it extra, think of it as incorporating movement into your life in a way to enhance your life and, and to start off slowly, to think of it as something that you can do to incorporate slowly that's going to make your life better. And I think if people can start with that attitude to sort of try to put aside their previous perceptions of exercise, their previous dread, their previous dislike of it, and to sort of start fresh and think, okay, I'm going to do this to enhance my life. I'm going to incorporate movement into my life in a way to make it better. I think that will help get you started on the right footing and lead you more likely to success. That is fantastic and fantastic advice. I absolutely love that. Robert J. Davis, where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? They can find me at my uh, website, healthyskeptic.com, and there they can find more information about me and about 
this book and my other books and get links to Amazon to order them. Also, I have videos, uh, short videos I've created about topics around fitness and nutrition and wellness uh, that debunk various myths at healthyskeptic.com. They can find me on social media, Robert Davis, Healthy Skeptic on Facebook and at Healthy Skept, S-K-E-P-T on Instagram. That is fantastic. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Robert J. Davis, PhD, uh, award-winning health journalist. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. I get really amped up when I get to talk to you, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of you and your work and for demystifying, again, what can be really complicated for people and watering it down to the most simple principles that will get a lot of people really good results. So thank you so very much for all of your work. Thank you for being willing to go back and revise some of the things that you put out in the book before and really overemphasize the points as you're learning more and more over time that you feel is really important. So thank you for doing that work and getting it out to people. And thank you so much again for spending time with us here on our show. Always fun talking to Casey. Thank you. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. It's really inspiring and amazing to see some of the reviews that we have been getting and also to receive so many messages and emails about how these episodes have improved our listeners' lives. And so thank you so very much. We are so happy to bring these episodes to you and provide them for free. And we really hope that they help you in your life. Uh, we have just passed two major milestones, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. And basically, we did both of these in pretty much the exact same day. We have just passed 100,000 downloads worldwide of Boundless Body Radio, and we have just launched our 250th episode, which is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I never imagined we could reach that many people. We always want to keep you updated on things that we're doing on our website. So if you go to myboundlessbody.com, you can always see what we're up to. This month, we have a link that you can go and schedule a functional movement screen, which we do virtually over Zoom. A functional movement screen is a series of seven different movements and three different clearing tests, which is designed to find weak links in the body, such as muscle imbalances and joint stability issues. It's a really great tool for discovering inefficient movement. And even if you're not experiencing pain in certain areas of your body. It's something that can prevent injury later on. Some muscles need to be stretched, some need to be strengthened, and we can help you create a plan around that so that you can stay healthy and continue to move well for the rest of your life. So again, you can go and schedule that at myboundlessbody.com. You will also see the other services that we offer. You can always schedule a complimentary 30 minute consultation with us to really chat about anything that you like. And remember, if you are enjoying Boundless Body Radio, please take a minute, give us a rating or review on Apple. It really helps get this passion project out to other people. And thank you again for tuning into Boundless Body Radio.